Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. And that's one of the great things about this episode that I'm doing here is a special episode is that I'm actually able to speak with some of the people uh, that have been listening. I thank all of the listeners for actually taking the time to uh, sp- listen to me, but it's great to actually have that conversation. So today, uh, one of the people that I've talked to uh, through instant messages uh, and from the website uh, is Bradley J. Cornish. And uh, we're going to be speaking with him today. Bradley is the creative force behind Black Ark Studios and Black Ark Magazine. He's the author of dark fiction and horror, including the web serials Mother and Goth Girl. You can find more info about those things from his website, uh, bksjarkstudios.com. So that's Black Arc Studios, but it's uh, I'll actually put that on the website because that's a little bit more of a, a mouthful than I thought it was going to be when I first looked at it. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Bradley's website and forum, they're up and active and he encourages other writers and creatives to join in. However, there's more to the story. And uh, it's what's really interesting about Bradley is that uh, not only in conversations, uh, I found out that he's a wellspring of information, but he also has a podcast called Four Brains, One Movie that just dropped its inaugural episode. He is, of course, one of the four brains. Uh, and uh, Bradley also oversees a quarterly open anthology with poetry and art, which uh, is going to be dropping its debut issue in about a week from now. It features 10 writers and artists and poets. It's going to be about 35,000 words of material. But the thing is, it's also free to download for anybody who wants to go to it. I'll ask Bradley at the end of this uh, to give me some links that I can put on my website as well so you can go there. But Bradley is also doing an anthology called More Decay from the Bradford Hotel. He's in progress of writing and editing this. Now, that's a lot of work. If you were to sit there and have someone uh, that was on a TV show, uh, someone who uh, was a respectable author, writer, poet, whatever, they probably would have a list somewhere around that level if they were really, really, really uh, working it hard. This is all a labor of love. Now, when I talked with Bradley, he was telling me that this is basically a passion. He has a terrestrial job, but this is the stuff that really makes him excited. And that passion boils over to all of these different avenues, but avenues that are also bringing other people in, which I think is one of the greatest things about that. So, uh, Bradley, thanks so much for being on the podcast on this interview. And thank you for that lovely introduction. I, I appreciate that. And not, you got everything problem. in there too. It's helpful, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Try to try to shoehorn it as best as possible. But I mean, that's a pretty big list. Why do you think you're so passionate about this stuff? It's it comes down to you know that's that's a crazy question. <laughs> I it is it's an interesting question. I I was very into movies and and reading as a kid and i was more focused on uh, the horror fantasy science fiction sort of thing and for whatever reason it dropped out of my life i would say probably in my early 20s up until about my late 40s and i just didn't read horror and i was Mm -hmm. really i watched my horror movies occasionally You know, when there's a good movie out, I always love movies, so I constantly watch movies, but haven't really done much in the way of horror. And then I picked up a book a few years back uh, by Joe Hill, Nosferatu, Mm -hmm. and and it, I don't know what happened, but I really enjoyed the book, and it ignited in me... uh, resurgence of interest for the horror genre 
and mm. how fun it could be. And it's a, it's a really fun book. And it's oh, a, yeah. yeah, a great sense of humor. And I love that, uh, you know, that sort of uh, twisted sense of evil that some of the characters have. And it's a, a nice mood to the book. And it got me thinking as well, uh, maybe I should try to write a, a little bit myself. And I sat down and for the first time, I from the first time I wrote, I was with each sitting doing maybe 2,000 words. And mm. it just it just flowed out of me. And it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, I, you know, I leave it up to, <laughs> to the people reading the, the stories that I write, uh, whether or not they're, they're of value or, <laughs> or mm. as fun to read, as fun to read as, I, it is, as it is for me to write them. But I really just uh, I haven't stopped since. And yeah. it's it all connects, you know. It all connects. Uh, the stories uh, g- connect to. I've always uh, done a little bit of artwork and photography. Uh, so once I started doing the stories, I started doing my own. I started doing my own covers, and then I started connecting with other writers. Started doing covers for them. Started uh, collaborating with them on stories. And next thing you know, I have a website, a podcast a magazine and about 30 or 40 short stories under my belt and a mm-hmm. couple of a uh, couple of projects on top of that uh, some weekly serials that I'm doing through the website and it you know it sounds like a lot uh, but to be honest with you it re- all it's done is just replace my TV time <laughs> you know and yeah. my mess oh. messing around time and mm-hmm. you know it's a, I see it as a uh, as a fun time for me Mm-hmm. More than anything. I can completely understand that. In fact, that's kind of how I ended up doing this was uh, it, it ended up being fun. I had this compulsion suddenly uh, that I needed to get this stuff out of me uh, and find a way to communicate it. And it was just a, a matter of some odd circumstance that got me there. I'm really interested that in a way you kind of had uh, you had your own resurrection uh, of uh, the horror enjoyment. It sounds like you have a little bit of uh, the same kind of thing that I do, which is I love all movies. So I, I love being able to talk about horror, uh, but put it at the same level of observation and review that I do for films that when I went to film school, I ended up watching and movies that I've been watching forever in a day that don't have anything to do with horror. Uh, I still see it as just as much of a beautiful art form as any of the others that are out there. Uh, and, uh, I can't say that I ever lost the love for it. Uh, in fact, in some ways, it was a little bit infuriating how much I continue to go back to horror, I'm sure, for my wife. But uh, I will say that there were times in the 90s where I was somewhat uh, disillusioned with what was going on. Uh, I kind of fell away from it a little bit. But... Uh, it sounds like you had a book, well, and Nosferatu is a great book. I would recommend if you haven't done Heart Shaped Box yet. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff that's in that as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, But uh, that's a resurgence. What, uh, what I always like to ask about is just the beginning of the obsession, and it usually happens when we're kids. But what was your first kiss, and, and why? Was it a book? Was it a movie? And what was it? You know, my first... Uh... My first interest in horror, it's, it's funny. Um, I, when I was a kid, I, I took a nice long walk from school. Mm-hmm. And, and there was a, a uh, I guess you would call them a drug store back then. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a convenience store. And this convenience store had, it had a really nice magazine rack. And when I would go in, I would always read the Fangoria magazines, mm-hmm. and I I was very interested in movie makeup, and you know the the fun little gory details. You know, there's a as a kid, you know, there's always a fascination with that. You know, especially mm-hmm. a young, being a young man. But mm-hmm. my fascination went a little bit further than that, where I was interested in movie making. I was interested in the directors, and that led to my starting to uh, read the, uh, in California, uh, the LA Times has a section called the calendar section, Mm -hmm. and when I was a kid, I would read the the calendar section, 
And, and the uh, calendar section was uh, just movie reviews. I'd read it front to back. There were a couple of little art theaters in my uh, neighborhood as well. And I would somehow con my mother into mm-hmm. write, writing a note for me so I can go see, <laughs> go see movies. And the movies right. that I and the movies that I was seeing at the time, uh, I would, I can't believe they let a kid into see these, you mm. know, frankly. But right. uh, I'm very grateful for it. I saw Taxi Driver when I was about 12 years old. Uh, I saw uh, <laughs> one of the most memorable movies for me was uh, uh, Andy Warhol's Frankenstein called Flesh for mm. Frankenstein. It was like yep. a gore, gory. Remember it well? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, this like a super gory, like a uh, hyper erotic 3D yep. movie. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting through it twice and uh, it just <laughs> blew, blew my mind. And, uh, you know, stuff and stuff like that, you know, it's always a, a bit of the uh, fringe stuff that I was interested in, mm-hmm. but not, not so much the mainstream horror. Uh, you know, I like uh, never really got into uh, even though I looked at the Fangoria magazines, loved reading about the effects for Friday the Thirteenth. Mm-hmm. Never got into Friday the Thirteenth, or you know, I didn't really like. Honest to God, I didn't like Halloween that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I saw that at, at the uh, drive-in theater when it first came out, and uh, sat in the back of the drive-in theater on lawn chairs with my friends. And uh, basically, basically, we'd sit back there and drink beer and, you know, watch, watch the movies uh, right. sneak in. But it was uh, that was a lot of fun. It was fun going to horror movies. But uh, I never really kind of liked those, uh, you know, the straight horror. I've always liked mm-hmm. the weird stuff, you know, even as a kid. Right, right. And, and I also, well, I'm, I'm going to talk about that at some point in one of the podcasts about the slasher uh, phase that went through horror. I was never huge on, on Jason, uh, but at the same point, I kind of watched them almost like a completist. <laughs> and You're I've got right. to tell you, you probably have the same kind of issue. I have movie directors that if you got me once, you hooked me once, I have to watch everything that you've ever done. And boy, that's a slog sometimes for <laughs> some of the films makers that are out there uh, and that's uh, really good ones as well like Robert Altman uh, boy making it through all Robert Altman films was a, a bit of a, a thing for a oh, yeah. while there yeah you get those great juicy moments but man uh, sometimes he was just killing me uh, and uh, Alan Rudolph was another guy I remember going to see yep. a, a movie where uh, they said this is Alan Rudolph's most accessible film yet and I'm like that's the advertisement is that it's finally accessible oh my god you got to be kidding me that's the best that you that's can say awesome. about this poor guy <laughs> yeah so uh, i i certainly get the the, the twist was uh, important to you i found that for me i got into a lot of foreign horror films because of that uh because i was in pennsylvania and where i was uh and it, you mentioned having to get a note for uh, your mom to for them to allow you to get into the theater and i i talk about that every so often too that i come from a time when they actually looked at the r rating and said where's your parent why are you coming into this thing we can't allow you and uh, a lot of what was going on at that time uh it was hard for me to get to see certain things but w o r t v out of new york city would put on these shows or these movies uh, on the million dollar movie and things like that, the the six o'clock movie. And they would just throw anything on, uh, just Mm -hmm. uh, have something to show every day. And I would see things like the bell from hell, which is a really, really twisted Dutch film. Uh, And uh, seeing that as a kid probably wasn't the best thing. And they barely edited them and they would do (laughs) slight editing. And, And so I'm, yeah, I'm watching some of this stuff and it's completely blowing my mind. And I think in a way, seeing that twisted stuff from different areas uh, kind of made surreal horror uh, something that was really interesting to me and uh, kind of impacted me more. And I think uh, I mentioned Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now was my my first kiss. And seeing that first 10-minute sequence, when all I was weaned on was 50s films and, and some early 60s films with my dad, and it's all the same paramount lighting and the dolly moves left and the dolly moves right and everybody's right. lit per- correctly and the microphone never changes. And then you're watching this movie where the first character that you see has their back to you and it's a uh, mid shot and uh, then you see them in silhouette and the sun's going through and it's handheld and it's shaking and as a kid 
because uh, I was used to a certain standard, seeing that uh, that shake actually made me nervous. And uh, I think uh, I look for that kind of nervousness whenever I'm watching movies at this point. And it sounds mm-hmm. like uh, you've obviously got uh, a, a ton of uh, movies that you love that are not horror. But of course, I'm always interested to find out what kind of movies you mentioned twisted horror so tell me a little bit about what you consider the horror with a twist well with uh, you, you mentioned nicholas rogue uh, i mm-hmm. was actually kind of contemplating this for the first time uh, based on some conversations we've had and the thing that i was contemplating is uh, why do i like certain horror movies and mm-hmm. the horror movies that I, I decided that I like, and it's pretty much a, a good rule of thumb. And it's, uh, it, the difference is a, a visionary a director or a visionary force behind the film. And that actually could be sometimes through the writing or the cinematography, not mm-hmm. so much the director or a combination of everybody. But the story being more based on a vision than a concept. So, for, mm-hmm. for example, zombie films, you know, that sort of thing. Never really liked zombie films. I like mm-hmm. 20, 28 Days Later, I think. It, it, and, right, um, yeah. It's really yeah, good. It, yeah, I liked, I liked that one, and I liked Night of the Living Dead, and I liked mm-hmm. uh, some of the Romero uh, movies after that, like uh, Dawn of the Dead and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. for the most part, uh, any sort of, uh, you know, uh, standard, you know, rule of thumb storyline where mm-hmm. it's almost like they, they have a box that they can't go out of and they need to stay within that in order to, you know, maintain what people are expecting within the storyline. And mm-hmm. when when I see it, and a lot of the uh, found footage movies are like that, mm-hmm. uh, where, where right. it's definitely more about a concept, uh, you know, like the Saw movies, stuff like that. Those are mm-hmm. about a con- concept and not so much, uh, you know, an overall vision from a director. And a good example of a visionary director would be like David Cronenberg. Uh, mm-hmm. where where his stuff, you know, there might be a loose storyline, but it's like if he thinks about something super weird, he's going to mm-hmm. film it, and he's not really going to care a whole lot if it's uh, considered, uh, if it freaks some people out, you mm-hmm. know, or maybe uh, uh, gets away from a, a standard a standard storytelling. Um and that sort of stuff is always fascinating me. I remember the first time I saw a racer head, even though I mm-hmm. didn't understand one thing. It, 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 <laughs> it totally freaked me. I had no idea what I was watching. I, I right. actually found it on um, one of the kind of pre-cable. Uh, there was a thing called On TV where you mm-hmm. pay 20, 25 bucks a month, and it was basically a de-scrambler. And you put it right. on top of your TV, and then uh, mm-hmm. you turn to a UHF channel, and then you hit on, and then it descrambles. And what I what I discovered was, if you fiddle with the knobs just right, mm-hmm. uh, you can you can get the uh, movie to uh, to uh, basically kind of come in almost clear. So it's mm-hmm. a kind of warped and wiggly and staticky, and uh, right. and that's the first time I saw a razor head. And I kind of mm-hmm. caught it about a third of the way through the movie, and I just watched it the entire time. And then for I was like, what the hell was that? And then uh, I didn't even know what it was until years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. then I was like, oh, my God, that's that movie I saw. <laughs> and right. then I, I, I watched it over and over and over again. And that movie is super creepy. And, oh, yes. uh, yeah, and some people don't can consider it horror. Uh, they consider, you know, almost like a psychological, you know, sort of uh, uh, surreal, you know, sort of exploration. But to me, it's it's there's horror, horror in it. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a horror film, uh, and I I sometimes chafe 
when I hear people go, well, because it's, I don't want it to be dumped in with the Jasons and the Freddies. I, I want it to be something else. And it's almost like what George Carlin used to say about language. You know, back in the first war, it was shell shock, only two uh, syllables. And you were right there with a the danger. And then after that, it became battle fatigue. Oh, they add one more word. No, now I'm just tired. It's not really an injury. And then post-traumatic stress syndrome. We use right. words to get away from the emotion. And so I feel that sometimes with uh, when people go, well, it's more of a psychological. No, it's what is the feeling that it gives you? Do you feel you're being psychoanalyzed or do you feel a sense of horror? Do you feel a sense of dread while you're watching the film? And I think that that's the thing. It's okay uh, I believe that it's okay that horror can ascribe to something much, much higher. And I feel that it's okay to come down into the pigsty every so often and wallow with us in the horror uh, genre as well. Now, I think that uh, Lynch has his own brand of horror. And I would say that just about every one of his films really is a horror film. And I, I challenge people to ascribe it to something else. Because I look at his films, and I, I don't know if you saw, but I had just made a, a comment on Twitter about how uh, Charles Lawton's Night of the Hunter, as far as I'm concerned, that's the template for all David Lynch films. I think that's the first David Lynch film that David Lynch didn't direct. Because this is a movie that you have a fairy tale feel to it, but there's also realistic, savage violence that's happening. There's real dread and fear, but the characters, uh, the adults, are seen through children's eyes. And I always look at Blue Velvet as being this thing where you are looking at adults in horrible drama and sex and all of this stuff, which is frightening and confusing to children, is shown as frightening and confusing. And you get this feeling, feel my muscles, feel my muscles. I was always right, like, man, right. oh man, Frank Booth is just like my uncle's friends when I was like 10 and he was 18. And these guys would come oh, in yeah. and look at like, hey kid. And it was all that kind of thing. He takes adult things and he draws them down into the real fear pit when you're a child. And so I, I think that most of his films, if not all of them, uh, are essentially horror films that ascribe to much, much more. I think a perfect example in Eraserhead of the type of horror that I like, you mentioned uh, uh, from the eyes of the, uh, the innocents. Mm -hmm. the, I think David Lynch probably considers himself a, a, the innocent. And mm -hmm. a lot of his protagonists, you know, in Eraserhead, uh, you, you have your protagonist basically just stopping and watching these bizarre, mm -hmm. horrible things and just staring at them. And that's kind of uh, almost the way that I've I've watched my uh, horror movies, you know, mm -hmm. where or or if there's something horrible, you know, that that happens that might be fascinating, you know, in the news mm -hmm. or something like that, where it's almost like a don't flinch, you know, don't like uh, I'm not I've never covered my eyes in a movie, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, it's a, like the scene in Eraserhead where he's sitting at the dinner table and the little chicken starts uh, <laughs> right. starts moving, moving and, and the camera just sits on, on it for a while and, he, and he's just staring at it and it's just like having no idea what the hell is going on, but he's fascinated with it. Right. And right. and the, the horror is in that fascination and that uh, not really knowing what's going on. But mm -hmm. what is going on may or may not be dangerous, or it may right. just be ludicrous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Frank Frank Booth. Uh, you know, when he comes onto the scene, is he truly dangerous, or is he just a, a you know off off his rocker? And we right. find out that it's dangerous. The guy's mm -hmm. super dangerous, and. Yeah. You know, and to me, that sort of stuff, like back to Night of the Hunter, what's so fascinating is it's like you, you just don't know what the hell this guy's going to do. Right. And, you know, that's that's established and that's, uh, you know, that's scary to me. Oh, that's yeah. That's not knowing, not knowing what's going to happen next uh, mm -hmm. or what that person is going to do or who might be harmed. Uh, that to me is scary. And when you have... Uh, you know, kind of your usual slasher type flick. You know, mm -hmm. the fun of those movies is like, okay, there's the, uh, you know, there's the uh, 
kind of the slutty girl, you know, and they always get killed first, <laughs> you know, and it's right, like they're right. pick, picking out these, uh, these stereotypes and just kind of watching it all come together. But uh, those, those aren't my, you know, repeat watch movies, you know, right, definitely. Right. Well, I think uh, when, when you mentioned Night of the Hunter uh, and uh, Mitchum's character specifically, uh, of course, uh, he's very dangerous, but he's also uh, calculating. But what I think is really interesting and what makes me think of Lynch so much is that there's almost a comedic thing to his at his scariness. There are times where he's running at the kids, going up the stairs, and his arms are reaching out, almost like a cartoon. He could be Wile E. Coyote. Uh, there's a, a moment when uh, he's shot at, and he stands straight up in the, in, the, in the frame, and at first you're scared because he's in the front of the frame, and he's not even supposed to be in the house. But then his face is absurd. He's absolutely a, a wounded wolf. You know, He's making howling noises while he's hobbling away. And so there's this animalistic thing. There's this cartoon kind of thing. It's abstract in its own way being scary. And I think that that's what was really interesting about that. And that's something that I see in Lynch a lot. You know, hi, neighbor. My name's Paul. You know, all of that. I'm, I keep going back to Blue Velvet because it's uh, very good at being able to show that point very quickly. There is this weird thing where you're almost laughing at it. It's almost like Pinter, where you have this thing where you have uh, uh, men who come in and they're just angry. But what they're talking about is you have no idea why they're angry. You can't make sense out of what's happening at this hunting party. Why are they mm -hmm. so angry? What's going on? And, uh, and there's horror involved in that. And uh, that kind of weird thing of where there's menace, even though there's nothing menacing happening, is really interesting. Or there's the antithesis of, uh, of menacing in some ways. You know, a guy sitting there putting makeup on himself going, pretty, 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 should <laughs> give me belly laughs, right? But it doesn't. Right. You know, because the context is really, really disturbing. And so I've always thought a lot of that movie. And I'm interested, uh, you know, you mentioned visionaries and vision. And I will say that some of the movies that you've been talking about, talking about them as contextual uh, versus, say, visionary, uh, before I go down this railroad track, let me first say that one of the guys that I really put in that spot is Ken Russell for The Devils as well as Altered States. I right, think both right. Of these movies are amazing in their visual imagery. But I also give credit to the firsts of many of the things that are now tropes. So uh, Night of the Living Dead being the first uh, zombie movie, you know, really broke a lot of boundaries uh, and was uh, kind of uh, bizarre in how it was shot. Uh, Carpenter's Halloween, I may not like the other ones, but the first one, uh, that broke down all of those cliches by taking some of them to the furthest extent. But he also sat there and did something very visionary, which was stripping away all of the artifice of the, what you're used to for a bad guy. The bad guy's going to be like Rote. He's going to get back up uh, and wait until dark. He's going to attack again. Well, they're going to shoot him three times, and it's going to come something really bizarre. But it's the idea of him being a blank slate and having uh, all of your thoughts projected upon that, all your fears projected upon it. I will mm -hmm. say that the original Blair Witch, I feel the same way. That one released us from all of the gloss and all that boring entrapment of uh, how the box should look and when we're in the third act and when we're in the second act. And it may be absolute uh, amateurish uh, luck, but luck and genius sometimes <laughs> walk hand in hand. And the idea of that entire movie was experimental in the way that they didn't even really have dialogue for these guys. And they were just out there, and you as an audience member are bringing all of whatever you bring to it. So some people just see a shaky movie. Others right. are lost in the woods with them. And uh -huh. that tells me it's kind of like a Rorschach test, which makes it very experimental. In fact, uh, Blair Witch becomes, because it made $294 million or whatever, uh, it became standard or became mainstream. But that was probably the most experimental horror movie that had come out in a long time. And when I was watching it, I championed it completely because it was not, I saw what you did last summer. It was not scream. It was not these things where I'm just counting off the minutes until, oh, there we go. There's the next death. Uh, this was using its own weird time structure. And that could be amateurish, but that weird time structure when you're a movie guy, uh, not having it there gets you into unfamiliar territory. And I love when a movie 
makes me feel like I don't know what's going to happen next. Like, whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. And sometimes that happens in some of the trashiest films. You know, Jess Franco used to do that to me. You know, you'd see these movies that uh, I wouldn't recommend to, uh, you know, uh, people who don't really like horror movies or are uninitiated or just starting out. But I look at them and I go, wow, this is amazing stuff because I... I'm seeing something that is relatively traditional, a werewolf movie, a vampire movie, and this is not what normally happens in these things. Uh, and the visual imagery, whether it be he was an amateur himself or he ran out of money or whatever, he would use that in a way that made it very, very uh, interesting to me. Jodorowsky is another guy that uh, when I watch his movies, even though Santa Sangri is probably the only one that's true, true, true horror, uh, it's amazing the imagery that he's doing on that with a shoot string budget and uh, you know that's the kind of visionary thing that I also love but I don't throw away the originals those those benchmarks that alter where film goes and uh, I think that there's several that are considered old saw now old hat because they've had a million sequels or they've had a million movies ape them but the original itself at one point was a spark that really caused all of that to happen. And so I still uh, appreciate them because if I saw them, especially like uh, Chainsaw when these things are first happening, uh, I am completely uh, enamored. Uh, I am completely out of my, my depth uh, watching these things, and it's absolutely fresh and original. And that was the kind of thing that I felt with several films and probably why I still get a little gaga over horror. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, and I think... With uh, with Halloween, he uh, Carpenter created a, a almost like a dream a dreamscape mm-hmm. within within suburbia, right. and with uh, with Blair Witch, uh, that was very it was very visceral, you know, almost like mm-hmm. a, a long dream sequence, and there were uh, there were a couple of very strange things that happened in that that I really liked, like uh, the, the standing in the corner and you know yeah. the, just some really off the wall things where you're just like, what's going on? But the um, uh, it reminds me of uh, how some directors uh, can communicate communicate uh, to a part of a person. That isn't mm-hmm. that necessarily the conversational side. Um, right. A lot of uh, yeah, and a lot of the uh, you know, it's like a lot. I relate to a lot of these movies, but I've never been chased you know through the woods by a witch. You know, right. I've never been <laughs> you know I've never been stalked by you know a masked killer. Um, you know, I I've never been trapped in hell basically, which is like right. a razor head. Right. And, Lucky uh, you. Uh, Right, right, but <laughs> but but I have gone through all those things in my dream time, and mm-hmm. I think I think everybody has gone through those things in their dream time, and mm-hmm. I don't know why there's such a uh, there's so many similarities and like everybody has a, having chase dreams and things like that, but mm-hmm. I think when when a director does that and does it well, it's almost like you are uh, that you're accepting that director to take you on a ride because they understand you. And, mm-hmm. you know, when right. you're, when, when I'm sitting back watching a movie, I'm like, uh, this guy understands me. And then I'm basically, I'm just transfixed with the movie. And yeah. I, yeah. And then I get hit by all the, all the little uh, things that the director wants to hit you with. And hopefully, you know, you walk away with a, a, a strong, you know, leftover vibe you know, from, from, from a movie. And yeah. there's, you know, that's, that, that's one of the uh, earmarks of a good movie for me as well is if it, if it messes with my head, you know, for right. like week, like weeks after, you know, one of the great guys for that for me is Roman Polanski. Uh, every movie that he's made from knife in the water, uh, all the way up, 
uh, has been somewhat horrible in some ways in the horror aspects, but he is a, a master of shooting something that you commonly would take a look at at one angle, and he shoots it at a different angle and juxtaposes that against your expectations. And, uh, I mean, uh, the idea of taking the most expensive face in the world, Jack Nicholson, and covering it with a bandage on his nose in China, oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a typical Polanski kind of move. Or having uh, somebody, you walk into a room and somebody's screaming already. And uh, one of the things in The Pianist was him walking down by a wall, and all of a sudden there's just screaming, and the first shot that you see is a kid uh, halfway from underneath, he's coming out of the ground, it looks like. And it takes a moment for you to realize that he was digging under the, 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 the fence and he was coming up on the other side and they caught him and they're beating him to death on the other side of that wall. And you only get that through feel. He doesn't show you that, but you get right. and understand what's happening. And Polanski was an, a master of doing that. And Repulsion is one of those movies that really blows my mind because very real moments uh, really excite me in a film when uh, people don't scream, oh my God, and stuff like that. And there's a great moment right. where uh, Deneuve uh, cuts him in the back of the neck, his, her uh, her landlord who comes in, he, she acts suggestive to him, he's about ready to kiss her, and she has a straight razor, and she slashes him in the back of the neck. And it's like up on uh, towards the, the head more than the neck. So it's not life-threatening, but he's horrified, and he runs over to the mantle and starts looking at the back of his head to see how bad it is, even though there's someone with a razor in the room. And that seems so realistic to me that you would just be in such shock and horror over something that happened like that. And you, it hasn't computed yet that that woman is capable of doing that to you again. And that is completely not what you would see in a movie. It's something that you'd see in maybe a play. But you wouldn't see in a movie, and I thought that that was really phenomenal that he put that in there. But right, and and what he's doing is he's he's basically uh, sharing with people the strangeness of the situation, mm -hmm. and it's, right. it, it it doesn't have anything to do with the story. Does it's not moving right. it along at all. It's just saying, hey, if this if somebody cuts you in the back of the head in this sort of situation this would be really weird and you would probably act very strangely. And, right. it's, uh, and to me, I, I love that stuff, you know, because yeah. that, that to me is, um, you know, it's something, it's something new, you know, it's something uh, it gets me thinking about something that I, I haven't thought of before. Right. There's, there's comedy and horror and there's horror and comedy at times. It's not ha ha belly laugh stuff, but it is, there is a, a a weirdness, like uh, not to go too deep into it, but deliverance. The, the, the stalking before the actual attack or the actual throwing down of Ned Beatty onto the ground is childlike. He's oh, almost yeah. acting like a crazy kid and a chimp. And it is so off-putting because he's doing this weird thing. He's not being the menacing guy with a big cape. He's instead uh, enjoying the shit out of it. And he's enjoying himself, and it's like this weird thing of he feels he has permission to do this, and he's just exuberant over it, and that's really, really bizarre and disturbing to me. Well, I, I uh, want to make sure that uh, I, I can put this on a podcast as quickly as possible. And we're going a little long, and I do thank you for giving me as much time as you did, but what I want to do, because it sounds like you're really a, a movie fan, and I do want to oh, kind yeah. of try and keep it to, to horror movies, but what I like to do when I hear someone who really is passionate and seems to have a wide depth, breadth, and scope of what's out there. Uh, I want to ask about movies by the decade. What's your favorite horror film, say, from the 30s? Favorite horror film from the 30s? Uh, if you have one. You know, I, the, one that, the one that sticks with me is Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any the, the James Whale stuff, you know, yeah. uh, Bride, of, Bride of Frankenstein. It's, uh, to me, those are... Uh, those are creepy little work. And when I watch them, I get pretty creeped out still. You know? mm -hmm. So that's uh, the 30s. Yep. And uh, haven't, uh, you know, you have all the universal stuff, you know, around right. that time period. And uh, to me, that was that was great. You know, and, and if, when people think about the universal films, they think it's this massive canon. 
There's only a right. handful of films, you know, sure. but they are so they were so fresh at the time, mm-hmm. and so so new that they've pretty much have in, ingrained themselves in people's psyche as being this massive thing, you know. And so that's real interesting. What's your favorite decade for film? F- favorite decade for film, uh, 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's where, you know, I saw Taxi Driver, One Flew the Cuckoo's right. Nest. Uh, you know, that's the, uh, th- those are the things where not only were they, uh, you know, impactful probably because of my age at the time. You know, when you're seeing the movie right. when you're 12, it's mm-hmm. probably going to mess with you <laughs> <It's probably laughs> right. more, you know, than other, than other time frames. But um, I also go back to the type of filming and like the, the naturalistic uh, style mm-hmm. of filmmaking that was going on and the, you know, zits and pimples, you know, sort of uh, mm-hmm. thing. And it was, uh, you know, they were almost uh, uh, rebelling against the, the gloss and glamour, you right. know, of the, of the previous Hollywood era. Were your favorite horror films also of the 70s, or did you find that that came in a different decade? Uh, my favorite horror films, uh, uh, probably more in the 80s. Um, mm-hmm. Dead Ringers uh, uh-huh. was, uh, yeah. is my favorite. It's my favorite horror movie, and it was my favorite movie for quite some time. I went back and rewatched it, and it does appear a little bit dated, <laughs> but uh, but it it's still the, still the ideas and the uh, you know horror you know at the level of tenderness in the movie, mm-hmm. uh, as well as the level of horror you know is, is just it's pretty insane. And then Hellraiser, uh, the original Hellraiser, yeah, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, just original. the idea. Yeah, and just the ideas be behind that and how bizarre they are in the uh, costuming and and whatnot. Uh, that's that sticks with me. And then another another one is Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Oh yes. I, wow. Yeah, I I saw I saw that in California, and I went to a movie theater uh, in Newport Beach, and I was the only person in the theater. And it was a, oh, wow. it was a, yeah, it was a really grubby theater, you know, like the floors were all sticky and everything. And uh, I remember driving home just with the emptiest feeling after mm. after watching that movie. And it uh, it it messed with me for a good couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. And it, that's a, yeah. That's a movie Not, that still haunts me. And uh, yeah. I can't I can't play it in the house. Uh, my wife will hear the music or the scream soundtrack that goes through that where people are like, ah, 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 and she will be asleep and she'll have a nightmare. She'll toss and turn. That movie hits her on a <laughs> really, really primal level. And I can't even, I have to watch it like under blankets or something to be able to get through it because of how she is on that. And for me, it's just uh, that movie was seminal in that hopelessness and helplessness that you're talking about. And I can tell you, seeing it in a theater with a bunch of people, you didn't feel any better. <laughs> you were really isolated by the end of that movie. You felt like you were the loneliest man. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's uh, fantastic that uh, you've uh, been able to give me as much time as you have on all of this. And there's obviously plenty of side conversations I think we're going to have on this uh, because uh, you've got a wellspring of uh, very interesting information. You're opinionated, which is also very nice. <laughs> so I was glad to hear that. Oh, and uh, what, what I uh, want to do is just uh, encourage anybody that's out there listening to this podcast, uh, take a look at what Bradley's doing. Uh, as I mentioned before, he's at Black Ark Studios and Black Ark Magazine. He's an author of dark fiction and horror. He's got two web serials, one called Mother and one called Goth Girl. You can find out more information at his uh, website. There's a lot in there, and why I say take a look is uh, you may find that you'll get into a great conversation as well. And on the other side of that, I want to make 
make sure that uh, uh, I open the doors here to anybody else who would like to speak. I'm more than happy to have conversations with anybody. If you get in touch with me by way of uh, my webpage, uh, my Twitter account, my Facebook account, uh, let me know what's going on with you. And if you'd like to tell me a little bit more about your first kiss, I'm more than happy to talk about that. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more with Bradley after this. But uh, at this point, I just want to say to everybody, thanks so much for listening and stay hell bent. Thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. For you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me, and I thank you in advance. And thanks for listening. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. If you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. It really helps. Thanks a lot for listening. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast. It's now available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can also keep up with Hellbent for Horror on iTunes at iTunes Podcast. That's on Twitter. You can find more on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbent for horror, and I'm on Twitter at hellbent horror. You can also find more info on my website, hellbentforhorror.com. Till next time, stay hellbent.